Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am now opening the hearing number 17 of the 187th period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. And this hearing is entitled Human Rights Situation of LGBTIQ plus persons deprived of liberty in Venezuela. And it was requested by the Venezuelan Prison Observatory, OVP. My name is Margaret May McCauley. I'm the president of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, and I'm the Rapporteur for People of African Descent and Against Racism and for the Rights of Older Persons. With me this morning are the first vice president and the Rapporteur for Venezuela and for children and adolescents and for indigenous peoples. Commissioner Esmeralda Oresamina de Troitino. Also with us are the is the second vice president and the rapporteur for LGBTI persons, Com Commissioner Roberta Clark. And also with us is the rapporteur for persons deprived of liberty, Commissioner Strado Rallon. Also present at this hearing is the Deputy Executive Secretary for Monitoring, Maria Claudia Polido, and the Special Rapporteur for Economic, Social, Cultural, and Environmental Rights, Soledad Garcia Monos. I give civil society who's here present with us and all those who I've just named and all those who may be online, the warmest and cordialest of greetings. Thank you for being here. Let me just explain the allocation of time. Civil society, you have the long time of 30 minutes for your submissions. And the commission panel will also have 30 minutes. And then civil society, you have a further 27 minutes after the commission has, has spoken. And then there will be closing remarks where we will end the hearing. The objective of the hearing is, uh, is to provide information about the human rights situation of LGBTIQ plus persons, the private of liberty in Venezuela, in particular to provide data on the violations they face in the context of their detention and in the context of the serious crisis in the Venezuelan prison system. With that, I now give the floor to civil society. Please commence your statement. Gracias, señora presidenta. Gracias, comisionados. El Observatorio Venezolano para el Observatorio. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, Commissioners, for us. It's a pleasure to have this forum of advocacy hosted by the Inter American Commission of Human Rights. Here we have Maria Angel Rincón and Carmen Varela, Aguada, and me, Carolina Giron, the coordinator. Our organization since 2002 has maintained as its main objective the comprehensive defense of human rights and personal dignity of persons deprived of liberty in Venezuela. The OVP has a multidisciplinary team made up of lawyers, penitentiary specialists, and collaborators from different areas who make possible the process of defense and protection of fundamental rights of persons deprived of liberty in Venezuela. The, the population deprived of liberty um, is a product of a sustained neglect and structural crisis. Over time, they are uh, in their life is in threat due to the level of overcrowding, the procedural delays, the violation due to the, the process of law and the lack of medical treatment. The population is of about 32,000 people in 52 prison centers. 12 have been closed. One of them is only a women's prison and the 
uh, rest of the women are in 16 uh, annexes. According to the last data of a popular of a journalist report, LGBTQI people deprived of liberty are uh, the population is around 190. This in 2019, and then my colleagues will develop this for further, but we have to uh, underscore three aspects. Venezuela has not prom uh, passed laws to protect the uh, rights of LGBTQI people, such as uh, the uh, same-sex marriage, even though it recognizes the progressivity of human rights, these laws have not been passed until date, according to the rules of the penitentiary penitentiary code, there are no provisions regarding LGBTQ plus people deprived of liberty. People are detained in prison centers according to the sex in their ID. There are no official public data that accounts for the amount of people deprived of liberty with a disaggregation of uh, differentiated groups. Among the causes, we can include the lack of control of penitentiary centers. 48% of the prisons are under prisoners' control, all under the um, approval of uh, the executive branches and the different uh, institutional bodies. And the LGBTQI people are uh, afraid of, uh, of abuse and they have to hide their uh, sexual orientation or their identity. I will leave now the floor to my colleagues who will talk about the context and the situation lived by LGBTQI people in the prison centers in Venezuela. Good morning. As to the right to food, the state does not comply with its obligations facing these uh, population. Uh, the food within the prison centers is insufficient um, from the caloric point of view because it does not pro uh, provides the amount required by the WHO. So they depend on their family and their relatives and they have to um, re replace the obligations of the state. The um, LGBTQI people um, and the requirements varies if they have any health issues. They are not granted food at the beginning because they do not have always uh, communication with their family because they reject their sexuality or their identity, and this leaves them more, more vulnerable. The use also of isolation as a protection measure is used uh, since they, uh, they think they may be um, abused and during their separation, they do not receive food tuberculosis and malnutrition are the main causes of death in our prison centers, pneumonia, pneumonia hepatitis, and also skin diseases and gastro, gastro diseases are the more uh, common conditions and LGBTQI people also suffer the abandonment from the state. It's important to uh, pinpoint that uh, the reject uh, they receive also um, prevents them from receiving food. Apart from not having access to medical treatment, they are discriminated against and outcasted by other people who are deprived of their liberty, even from officials who talk of them as AIDS um, people. And uh, there are also uh, risks on uh, on threats on receiving reprisals. There are people who stop uh, taking their retroviral medication because they were afraid they were going, going to be abused. As to the right to sexual health of LGBTQI people, this is limited by the possibility to receive conjugal visits. 
within the prison center, there are no access to condoms or to menstrual cups or sanitary towers. And this situation exposes them to infections, uh, of, uh, sexual infections. And this is a source of concern for this organization since if the medical condition uh, is known by the custodians or by the population, that information is disseminated within the prison centers and they are humiliated. For trans people who are deprived of liberty um, in the middle of a hormone process, they cannot continue with these processes, such as uh, since the hormone treatments are not warranted. Uh, the same happens with medication for other uh, medicines, for other conditions, for other uh, disorders. And this is only possible when they have an express authorization by the directors of the prison centers. Even though the hormone treatment is not mortal, if it is suspended, um, these people are prevented from their gender expression and the state should warranty these for the insufficiency and the abandonment and neglect of these centers. The people do not have a medical team that can monitor and uh, follow the impacts that these uh, hormones or the suspension of these hormones has. When the family try to attend to their family in prison, in the case of mental, mental health, there are no professionals to treat them. Therefore, it is not accessible for this group of people who have to face with these emotional situations related to stigmatization. They are also denied their identity when they are treated, LGBTIQ plus suffer ill treatment and systematic violations of their rights. They are trying to survive and therefore they suffer health issues, depression, and also food disorders. Good morning, everyone. In Venezuela, we have documented the prohibition that uh, people can prepare food in the prisons or share spaces. They are considered dirty people. Um, here we have the case of CQ Rivas, a trans activist and community leader who after a demonstration in the public square requested better conditions for the LGBTI community. He was She was repressed first by the um, police and she was transferred and detained in Pirito. During her detention, she received ill treatment by the officers. She was offered to drink water that was polluted. She was under unhealthy detention conditions, and she could only eat what her mother took to the prison. Torture acts against LGBTIQ plus should be considered from two perspectives. In Venezuela, intra-prison violence uh, includes the use of war arms, grenades, etc. The inmates have these weapons and therefore runners are empowered and they determine the rules within the prisons. They traffic drugs, arms, and they also commit acts of corruption. These pranas are men in the prisons and they are considered or call themselves as machos in the prisons. They are homophobic. Therefore, LGBTIQ plus persons are victims of physical and verbal violence by these pranas. They are forced to clean the cells and they also demand um, money to give LGBTIQ plus persons access to visits and some benefits. Also, we were aware that when um, this uh, activist was detained in Santana de Táchira, she was detained together with other four women, but she was discriminated because she was lesbian. 
and she had to um, suffer violence there. Also, we have documented that officers use um, insults to refer to LGBTIQ plus persons. And also they use prolonged isolation uh, for LGBTIQ plus persons. There are specific cells aimed at not only protecting, but punishing LGBTIQ plus persons. Persons in these spaces have no access to sunlight, to food. Uh, they are not in contact with the outside world and they have no access to education or recreation activities. In 2022, we documented that in some of the centers, those men who were considered themselves as gay or bisexual were transferred to these cells and they were discriminated. LGBTIQ persons were submitted to different types of jokes and discrimination. There was also a case of an inmate who was isolated just for saying that he was LGBTIQ+. Also, this person indicated that he was forced to scream, I like women and I'm a macho. Now he is in a different cell and he was forced to behave as a man, as a man. And he had to collaborate with officers and to do the cleaning and to provide the food. This is the only way in which he was accepted. Finally, and according to one of the complaints that we received at our organization, the cells in which gay men are recruited or kept are punishment cells. And when inmates uh, need to be punished, they are sent to cells where LGBTIQ plus persons are uh, kept. Thank you. Good morning. In any prison in Venezuela, telephone calls are allowed. This is, uh, they are punished if um, telephones are entered to the cells. What we have documented is that there is a lack of recognition of rights and there are no rules to recognize same-sex marriage even within the prisons. And therefore, visits from their partners are not allowed to these detention centers. Also, there is no possibility uh, for the inmates to decide if they want to be searched by a woman or a man. Um, visits or the persons who visit should not mention that they are having a intimate relationship with the inmate. Also, also men visits are not allowed in some detention centers. So transsexual and gay um, persons deprived of liberty are not allowed to receive visits. They are discriminated. Also, um, money is demanded to request the access or of intimate visits. For example, when we talk about trans persons, visits are allowed only if the ID of the visit is uh, recognized as a female in their ID card. So also we have LGBTIQ+, who are abandoned by their family members and they do not receive any mess visits. And this affects their survival in the prison. In Venezuela, family members are the ones who provide the inmates with food and with medicines. And therefore these people who have no visits have to collect waste and do the cleaning in exchange of food and medicines. This is a way also to avoid ill treatment in the prison. There are no areas that care for the needs of LGBTIQ plus persons deprived of liberty. Also, um, LGBTQI plus persons cannot make any decisions regarding their um, detention 
person, uh, places. The lack of training of the staff is clear at the different levels of the judiciary. A staff is not trained with a human rights or gender perspective approach. Also, there are no training mechanisms. There are no monitoring or complaint mechanisms either. The lack of expertise of officers um, is clear when it comes to the difference between gender and sex. Uh, the officers are not aware about the specific needs of LGBTQI plus persons, and this hampers any progress that could be made when it comes to torture or ill treatment, etc. Some trainings that are provided are just simple conversations, and there are some memory events. However, during the rest of the year, the issue of LGBTIQ plus persons is silenced. Even high profile officers are not aware of any of the matters related to LGBTQ, uh, LGBTQI plus persons. Also, abuse of power is employed and this threatens the life of LGBTQI plus population. The state has not implemented any measures to recognize their rights. The state has not investigated or sanctioned any type of violence against this group of persons. Also, civil society organizations have not been able to support when they discover the gender, gender of the person, there are arbitrary punishment against this person, such as punishment and inhumane treatment. When they search persons, the penitentiary staff is not aware of international standards in this matter, and they do not take into consideration human dignity, and searches are invasive. Invasive. Taking into consideration this terrible situation suffered by the Venezuelan population and the serious human rights violations suffered by LGBTIQ plus persons deprived of liberty, we would like to request uh, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights to call upon the government of Nicolás Maduro to comply with international standards in penitentiary matters and to comply with is established in the national legislation in order to guarantee all persons deprived of liberty, dignified and respectful conditions of human rights. Also, we would like the government um, to be a guarantor of the conditions of detention of persons deprived of liberty. They should comply with the obligations because they are under their watch. Also, there should be a special protection for persons deprived of liberty, especially those vulnerable groups, including LGBTIQ plus persons. There should be an approach that is based on their special and intersectional needs. This includes providing the penitentiary staff with the adequate training. Also, to prevent, investigate, sanction, and repair human rights violations against LGBTIQ plus Q plus persons deprived of liberty in Venezuela, and to implement public policies that are transversal and with a human rights approach that promote inclusion and respect for sexual orientation, sexual identity, and gender equality according to international standards, to design and implement a record of persons deprived of liberty, disaggregating those groups that are vulnerable, to assess and implement the contributions made by the different actors within the civil society and to have different spaces of active participation and discussion to address the issues related to the situation of human rights in detention centers. To design also to evaluate and implement the contributions made by the different actors and to open a space of discussion and also civil society organizations should be able to enter the prisons to monitor human rights in detention centers in Venezuela. Those are our contributions for today. We know that we presented a lot of information, a lot of raw information, and this information uh, proves the serious human rights violations against LGBTIQ plus persons uh, deprived of liberty in Venezuela. Thank you to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights.
thank you very, very much um, for your extremely valuable uh, um, uh, submissions that you made for to us to inform us of what's going on um, or in reality in the prisons. We had some idea, but this is bad. And some of those photographs, one couldn't bear to look at them. Anyway, we now come to <clears throat> the panel of the commission intervening, and I invite the first vice, uh, first vice president and country rapporteur to make her interventions and comments. We have 30 minutes. So Esmeralda, you can speak as much as you Bien. like. Gracias, Presidenta. Gracias, Presidenta. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to especially greet the organizations of the civil society and also the observatory of prisons. The, what we are seeing is a total violation of human rights. We are seeing that the state is not complying with its international duty to guarantee the rights of persons deprived of liberty. Regardless of any um, characteristics, I am concerned about the pranes because we have this control of these inmates. I think that they make up criminal organizations that manage everything that has to do with a drug and armed trafficking. And I would like to know if you have information about this, because there is a penitentiary system with officers with a structure I don't know if the penitentiary system belongs to the executive branch or if it belongs to the judiciary. It depends on the legal framework of the country. But I think that there is a responsibility. If I'm talking about criminal liability or responsibility of these institutions, the judiciary Venezuela must be aware of all these situations that are occurring in prisons. We know that in every prison there are difficult conditions, but in Venezuela, the situation of prisons is being assessed at an international level by the international community. So that's why I'm asking. I know that there are institutions in Venezuela, although they are subjected to one or the other power, but I would like to know what their response they give, that these institutions give to the Venezuelan population, how they react to the control and the power of these criminal groups. And also I have a question regarding the information that you have received by the International Criminal Court and by other international organizations, by the UN. I would like to know what the stance is in these organizations and what type of communication you have with these organizations, especially when it comes to the need to comply with basic conditions in prisons, such as the right to health, to physical integrity, to mental integrity of 
persons deprived of liberty. So those are my questions so far to understand what these crimes against humanity mean. I know that in Venezuela, this is a situation that should be address that should be a reply by the state. So that would be all. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I think I would go as, as, as it's listed in the scripts and invite the second vice president, who is the rapporteur for LG, LGBTI plus people. Uh, no, you are for LGBTI um, yeah. um, to intervene now. Thank you very much, President Macaulay, and good morning to everyone, and especially to the representatives of civil society organizations, human rights defenders, all of you. And I want to commend your, your brave work of monitoring the state in very, very complex and difficult circumstances. As you know, the Commission has had occasion on several times to comment on the conditions of detention in Venezuela. In fact, we've characterized those conditions as deplorable. Um, we've, we've been discussing the, the negligent medical care, the absence of facilities, difficulties in accessing food, drinking water, and you spoke about polluted water this morning, uh, medical attention, and, and, the, and just the level of violence. I think um, we got a real good sense of what I call the criminalization of prison management, uh, which the Pranis seems to represent, because they are criminals who are more or less in charge of the the, the, the run-ins of the of the of the prison. And they 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 use that management, of course, for corrupt, for corrupt practices. So I I you know I think we we really appreciate us you drawing attention um to that. And of course LGBTI persons lack uh, many of their basic rights under ordinary circumstances, but gender identity is not recognized. Um, there are a whole host of stigmatizations associated with the LGBTI status, lack of access to um, non-discriminatory healthcare and so on. So in the context of imprisonment, their vulnerabilities are multiplied. I mean, this is really what you call intersectional um, uh, oppression and, and discrimination. Um, and so I think we are attentive to what you think the commission can do. The commission has recommended to the state of Venezuela on several occasions, the adoption of, of prison policies um, and, and with uh, some focus on ensuring access to just the basic conditions of a dignified life for those who are incarcerated, access to decent drinking water, to food, guarantees of adequate medical care. And we will keep on using our voice and our space to call for those uh, policies and we look forward to considering your recommendations more closely. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. I call on, on the um, Rapporteur for Persons Deprived of Liberty, our brother Strado Rallon, Commissioner Strado Rallon. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to first thank and commend the work the organizations of the civil society have been doing and who have presented as the, their conclusions and their look on the differentiated impact on, on LGBTQI plus people deprived of liberty. I would like to say that whenever we have a special hearing from Venezuela in the Commission, regardless of the topic, we hear really moving information, really tough, raw information of a situation that in each of the diff of the different situations in which human rights should be respected, we see exactly the opposite. And we know, we see that there are lots of people suffering and who are 
living a dramatic situation every day on a daily basis in Venezuela. When the organization started speaking, they said there is a penitentiary system which is in which is ruined. And I think that phrase is a heading that reflects what you what you expressed further afterwards. The system which is completely ruined is uh, provides a, a system of abandonment and LGBTQI people are not in the custody of the state. They are completely ab abandoned and they are trying to survive in non-humane conditions, in human conditions. This is what we have heard today from what you presented. And this is something that we cannot see as normal. The commission has to keep on voicing its concerns so that this situation is made visible. When we hear the petitions, the organizations uh, do and the calls on implementing public policies and on evidencing differenti differentiated impact of having a disaggregated registry and that the organizations that do this work can somehow verify and help these happen. Well, I think this is a very important call that we should express. In general, these hearings in the uh, 187th period of session, I believe that this topic that we have you have brought here today must make us analyze the, the information that you have provided us today and so that we can issue a specific release on the differentiated impact on people deprived of liberty in Venezuela, because that visibilization is our job. And I also think that I have a question and it's it has to do with the work you do. If it's possible for you to visit prison centers and what is the ability to collect information that you have because the lack of information in Venezuela and the isolation in Venezuela? Well, as you know, the commission is not allowed to enter in Venezuela. So the work that we can do is just to uh, feed from your information, from your updated information. So it would be interesting to know how on the daily basis, how is that monitoring activities that allowed us to present this information and whether these can be sustained all throughout time and whether the organizations or some of the organizations with which you work is allowed to enter the prison centers in Venezuela. Um, I would like to express my solidarity. This is very tough what you have said and we have to uh, make this visible and in the plenary of the commission we are really moved by Venezuelan topics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, <coughs> Commissioner. I now invite the, um, the Deputy uh, Executive Secretary of Monitoring to intervene. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to first greet the Venezuelan prison observatory who for over two decades have worked and denounced the situation of persons deprived of liberty in Venezuela. I would also like to recognize the braveness of people that who from the observatory are working in Venezuela Given the background, which is so complex, and the reprisal that civil society organizations have been subjected to in that country, I would also like to um, 
underscore the work the commission has been doing on, on the last few years through the annual report and the country reports. The commission has since 2008 uh, closely following the situation of people deprived of their liberty through the report published in 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022 in chapter 4B of the Inter-American Commission of the annual report. But these reports are always uh, not so thorough if you compare it with the seriousness of the information that you are showing today and that we already know of that penitentiary system, but it's also worse for LGBTQI people. So we would like to say that we are going to follow the instructions by the reporter for people, persons deprived of liberty, but it's also very important because the commission will be working in the annual opera operation 2024. And in that vision, cross-cutting vision, Commissioner Roberta Clark posed as a reporter for LGBTQI plus persons and commissioner Estuardo Rallon for persons deprived of liberty and the leadership of the reporter, country reporter, we will um, work further in this topic. So we would also like to express our solidarity and we would like to undertake the commitment to keep on working with the uh, efficiency that this topic requires. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Deputy Executive Secretary. I now invite the Special Rapporteur on Economic, Social, Cultural, and Environmental Rights to intervene. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam President. Muy buenos días a todas, a todos. Good morning, everybody. I would like to express my admiration towards the Venezuelan prison observatory and the LGBTQI people deprived of liberty in Venezuela. I am reaching the end of my mandate and this is my last day in public hearings of the commission. It's really moving for me to be in this hearing on Venezuela, which is a country which has not let me sleep during these six years due to the emergency um, humanitarian emergency the country is living with. And that is why I would like to highlight this uh, hearing. And that thanks to the openness of the commission, there are spaces for organizations such as yours can enrich us with your contributions, uh, taking into consideration the invisibility of human rights. So I would like to thank the commission for their confidence, uh, their openness. And without that, it would have been impossible to move forward as we have done in the inter-American system in relation to all the ESER rights. Today, you have talked about the um, access to water, to food, which are easy rights, which are essential to people. And that is something persons deprived of liberty do not have access to in Venezuela. That is why I would like to share a report that we published on the ESC rights of trans and diverse gender persons as a reflection, which is very important in this topic. You have informed us of a uh, an overview which is uh, really serious and I would like to call upon the protection of all those persons who are persons above all and I really liked the Nelson Mandela phrase with which you close your hearing. The society must be judged on how they treat those who have less and we have proven that the ESC rights of people deprived of liberty are one of the greatest challenges in the region. 
And my question is if there is in official information on which sources can the commission consider to follow up this serious situation? And on the other hand, if there is any situation of privatization of companies that may uh, that may have under their charge their services. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, um, uh, Special Rapporteur. Um, <clears throat> before I invite civil society for their second um, submissions, let me just say a few words. I'm I'm such, sort of uh, outside the loop of uh, the previous speakers from the commission. Um, but this is a matter which must engage any person who is even just a little bit interested in the human rights of persons. And as I adopt everything which has been said, and it seems to me that incarceration of peoples is an experiment of humans which has failed and continues to fail. And in fact, it encourages those who wish to discriminate, to punish, to endanger, to destroy others can use to do so. Because you get a group of people like the LGBTI group who are generally discriminated against, abused in every way or form, made invisible, not as, uh, considered in the social provisions of the state. And you put them in a system, in a prison. You grab them and you put them in prison under the control of people who can treat them in any way that they wish. In, and, and I'm not talking now about the, the princes. I'm talking about the guards who are state agents who are supposed to care and make sure that they are treated with respect and dignity. Just because they are in prison doesn't mean they have become insects or something like that. They're entitled to be treated as every, uh, any other human being except that they are confined. But this doesn't happen. And when you have a prison system in a state like Venezuela is going through now, it is even worse for LGBTI uh, group of peoples to be in the control, the confinement that they put them in. So we thank you very, very much for bringing all this information to us. And I think it behoves the commission to do what it can in the circumstances of Venezuela's position at the moment, which is to publicize as much as possible what is going on in the prisons of Venezuela and the treatment of LGBTI peoples. I, um, this is one of the tools that's used in international human rights institutions to try to force states to toe the line and meet the standards which are accepted internationally for the treatment of persons within state custody. And they are within state custody. They didn't walk into the prison by themselves. They were picked up by state agents and put there. And it's state agents that will prevent them leaving. So the state is responsible. And I think we have to keep on publicizing what is going on. So perhaps you can continue to give us information about what is going on so that we can continue to publicize the facts as others would not know, know them. And thank you again for, for your, your submissions. So um, I now, invite you to do your second and closing uh, um, submissions and you have 27 minutes. Thank you. Primero, 
Agradecemos a la, a la, a la, a la First, comisión. I would like to thank the commission and their commissioners for the relevance being given to this topic because it's people who have no voice. Unfortunately, the more the poorer people, the less educated people and people who do not have other options of a different life, of living a different life. That's unfortunately what happens. In order to provide an answer as to the Praner organizations, Pranad organizations, how they are called, Pranato, the states granted control to them of the uh, penitentiaries, of the facilities to the um, inmates. So they manage all the prison centers and the people are treated as slaves. They use firearms, as they have already explained, and in Venezuela, the, there is a monopoly of firearms. There is no uh, free sale of uh, weapons. So we believe that these weapons are given by the armed forces because there are no other explanation. Also, the amount of ammunition they have which are sold by, uh, by an organization of the state, which is a Venezuelan firearm company. These are the ones that have the grenades, the ammunition. They have the monopoly of these uh, weapons. Apart from these, they did these to reduce the index of uh, the violence index they are looking aside and this is happening these pranato organizations happens uh, and the, all of them know the pro prosecutor the executive the judiciary and this is evident because there are facilities where physically half of the of the prison center is under the control of the executive penitentiary executive and the the other half is under the control of the pranato so they coexist this is a situation that has no explanation how under the look under the approval of the all the institutions of the government they are there and the inmates are at the expense, expense of what they decide. They decide what you eat, where you're going to be within the prison center. And unfortunately, these criminal networks have become international and they reach Colombia, Chile, Peru, Ecuador. And these is allowed by the state. So there is no control possible. The state has the criminal responsibility. This has been informed to the Criminal International Court and the High Commissioner in the United Nations already knows about it, the reporters. And we have, uh, and the whole civil society have um made these fact known to all the multilateral organizations and the situation in Venezuela with the problem of uh, lack of access to food to drinking water they have to live where the solid um residues are and this is a daunting situation as Commissioner Rallon said, well, there is no uh, humane explanation to this situation because it's not seeing that pe persons deprived of liberties, well, they have been, they do not have their liberty, but they should have rights. They should have access to drinking water. If women in Venezuela, spouses, mothers, do not get them food, they don't eat because the state does not offer to them quality food and with the regularity that a person should eat. So these are really daunting situations in relation to medical treatment and trans persons if the family 
um, can obtain uh, the hormone treatment and with the permission of the direction of the prison center, if they can have access to treatment, okay, they can continue with the treatment. However, these trans persons do not have medical treatment, their uh, health is not treated, and this is lost. Um, and they cannot uh, have their gender change. So there is a very serious situation. Como dice eh, la comisionera Soledad. Pues, Commissioner, well, Rapporteur Soledad said, there is no official figures. The opacity of information is one of the characteristics of Maduro's government. They try to make all these systematic violations invisible. And these violations are suffered by all the population in Venezuela. Of course, persons deprived of liberty suffer the most because in prisons there, are, there is no access to water, there are no hygiene conditions, there is no food, there are no medicines, etc. And at the same time, they criminalize civil society organizations and we are prevented from entering detention centers. However, there are brave family members, um, brave inmates who offer us all this information. We are able to do a constant monitoring thanks to the information provided by police officers, uh, what happens in social media. We do a lot of work in order to obtain truth, truthful information about what is happening in the prisons. And that's why we don't have information about how many LGBTIQ plus persons are deprived of their liberty in Venezuela because of this opacity. And when we have access to some lists, we have lists of men, women, and adolescents, but there is no disaggregated data. We don't know how many pregnant women are there, how many children are living in prison. We are all the time striving to obtain this data. And you can see this on the penitentiary system website. On the website, you have pictures of a beautiful situation that of course is not a reflection of reality. And I would like to bring your attention to the visits in penitentiary centers. Women that visit persons deprived of liberty need to wear white shirts and dark sheens, and they have to use sandals that expose their feet. And they are searched, they are forced to be naked. naked. They are undressed and there is no consideration whether women are old or young and they have to show their genitals to people they don't know. They have access to no bathrooms. There is no water. They have to jump. They have to uh, lie against the wall and show their genitals so that with the light of the telephone, they are searched to see if there is any, any illegal object or drug that they, they are trying to get into the prison. So that's the situation of the mothers and grandmothers of Venezuelan inmates. And sometimes it's, there is also a problem because uh, male visits or male family members are not allowed to visit their sons. Now in those prisons in which there are planes, anyone who pays can enter the prison center. There is no control. It's only about money. The only filter is that. So in general terms, that's the current situation in prison centers. And we are truly thankful 
that the Commission helps us. So that is disseminated. So everyone is well aware of what is happening, that you help us make this situation visible. And we want to show what persons deprived of liberty are going through in Venezuela. There are political prisoners who are living in a similar situation. There is no differences. Everyone that is in a present center is going through the same situation. And many people are in prison in a center that is far away from the jurisdiction where the trial is being held. And people sometimes need to travel 600 kilometers to visit their family members. When there is no access to fuel, we have a lot of po poor people. The minimum salary uh, at its maximum of 20 US dollars per month. So people are really poor. So we would like to thank you. We would like to thank the Inter-American Commission for allowing us to be here. And because we are sure that you will help us to give a voice for, uh, to those who don't have one. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, <clears throat> I don't think um, any of us can thank you enough, but please accept the words that we have used to indicate our thanks uh, that they are sincere and that you will continue to inform us because we have to walk the walk together. And um, my sister Esmeralda and I finish at the commission on the 31st of December at midnight. And we will still try to do whatever we can, even when we're not actively part of the commission, because we have to. And we have to respect our brothers and sisters who are going through what they're going through in Venezuela because of a government that does not respect their dignity as human beings. And rest assured that the commission will always do its best and, and effectively tell the world what is happening. And perhaps one day it will so embarrass the government that then they would do something or there will be a change in, so that circumstances for them will change. I mean, some of the, those pictures are so awful, so awful that one wonders how one people can be in a government and allow things like that to go on, you know? And so, I'm sure Maria Claudia will ensure that we act on whatever you've given us. If you have any um, um, document or you can send us copies of your presentations, please do so that the commission will have them at hand to work on. Yeah. Do you want to say something, Maria? Please. Sí, muchas gracias, señora Presidenta. Solamente yes, aprovecho. thank you, Madam President. I would like to inform that on Friday, July the 21st, sorry, on Thursday, July the 20th, there will be a presentation on women deprived of liberty in the Americas. And we would like to invite all civil society organizations at this hearing, and we would like to invite the observatory of Venezuelan prisons so that they can join that invitation. Thank you. Yes. That's very good. Thank you, Maria, for bringing that up. So um, we've now come to the end of, of this hearing, and it certainly is not the end of the actions for you and for the commission in this regard. Um, Com Commissioner Strado and, and Second Vice President Roberta Clark will be continuing in the commission, and I'm sure they will make sure that the focus and the attention and the commitment go on as they should and introducing new commissioners to the work which has to be done for the commission. 
you are really exceptional human rights defenders. And we thank and salute you for your work. Thank you. Excuse me, Commissioner, if we can take a picture before I oh, end gosh, it? Yes, the photo. I always forget the photo. No worries. <laughs> Thank Hola. you so much. Pueden eh, mirar hacia la cámara un ratito solo. Muchas gracias. Que tenga un buen día. Un saludo. Buenos días. Hasta luego. Nos vemos. Un saludo. Gracias. Saludos. Excelente día. Gracias por todo. Gracias. Seguir en esa lucha. Gracias a ustedes por acompañarnos. Un abrazo.